Lord, everybody. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Amen. We thank God for each and every one of you who have tuned in to watch our Wednesday evening Bible study. To those of you who are in the sanctuary, we praise God for you. Uh, as Minister Marvel continues to play, uh, let us go to the throne of God in prayer. Lord, we thank you for your goodness. We thank you for your mercy. We thank you, God, for your kindness. We thank you for your power. We exalt you, God, in this place, primarily for who you are and also for what you do. So we pause now in the middle of the week to give your name glory, to give your name honor, and to give your name praise. And now, God, as we approach your throne, we pray that you would impart wisdom and knowledge that we might grow and go for you. In Christ's name we pray. pray. Amen. I want to thank uh, Reverend Carl Brown, who has served as our uh, lecturer and uh, Bible study instructor over the course of the last couple of weeks as uh, I have been uh, traveling and I want to thank each and every one of you for uh, tuning in uh, this evening for our Bible study. Um, as we talk about tonight, uh, as we go forward in our Bible study, I want our foundational text to come from the book of Joshua, chapter 1, verse 8. And as you are going to Joshua, chapter 1, verse 8, it is important that you understand where this Bible study developed. And this Bible study developed from the sermon on Sunday. The sermon on Sunday we was entitled, If You Want What You've Never Had, It's Time For You To Do What You've Never Done. As I reflected on that sermon, the word that just came to mind over and over and over again was the word strategy. Somebody yell strategy. The enemy has a strategy for your life. The Bible declares that the thief comes but to steal, to kill, and to destroy. And as we understand the assignment of the enemy, we must also understand that the enemy does not carry out this assignment haphazardly. The enemy does not carry out this assignment in an unorganized fashion. The enemy does not carry out the assignment of stealing and killing and destroying you by, happen by happenstance or by coincidence. The enemy has a strategy that the enemy uses to steal to kill, and to destroy. Also, what I, what I thought about is oftentimes we talk about the devil. And when we talk about the devil as if the devil is one person. The enemy is not alone. The enemy has demons and imps and minions that are utilized and deployed in a way to steal to kill, and to destroy. So if we are going to be successful, we too must implement a winning strategy. So the topic of this Bible study is a winning strategy. That if you're going to be successful in your life, if you're going to make it, and notice when I say success, I am not referring to a particular destination. I'm not referring to a position. I'm not referring to an amount of money because success looks different for all of us. What is success? Success is arriving at the place that God has for you. And for all of us, that's what? That's different, right? And so as we talk about and, and, think, and think on the idea, if you want what you've never had, you have to do what you've never done. How do we do that? By implementing a winning strategy. Somebody ought to say, I'm implementing a winning strategy. And the reason why I love Bible study 
is because in Bible study, we can, are able to dig into the word of God to get a winning strategy. Somebody said the word Bible stands for basic instruction before leaving earth. I love the word, not just because it gives me fancy talking points, but I love the word because when we study the word, it gives us a winning strategy. The Bible declares the steps of a godly man, a good, good man or woman are ordered by who? God or the Lord. That's a winning strategy. That's a winning strategy. So we're going to look at, we're going to look at Joshua chapter 1, verse 8. All right? That's our foundational text for, uh, for our time together. And it reads, Joshua chapter 1, verse 8. This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate in it day and night, that you may observe to do according to all that is written in it, for then you will make your way prosperous. Somebody ought to yell strategy. And when, then you will have good success. So really what this text starts to do is to give us a strategy in order to have good success. What does it say first? This book of the law shall not what? Depart from your mouth. In other words, everything that I say has to be rooted in what? The word of God. We give the enemy territory and room when we speak things that are not of God. This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth. In other words, it shall stay in our lips day in and day night and, 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 and the night. Day, afternoon, morning, night, midnight, right? And what happens is when we face challenges in our life and the first thing that we do is complain. That means when we face challenges in our life and the first thing that we do is gossip or lie, we are giving the enemy room to steal, kill, and destroy us. But when we face challenges and when we face situations and we say to ourselves, I am more than a conqueror through Christ Jesus. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. I am the head and not the tail. When we allow the book the word of God to dwell in our lips, it paves the way for us, right, to, to, to have good success. That's called a what? A strategy. Somebody ought to yell strategy. But you shall meditate on it day and night. That means you should think about it day and night. And what's interesting, the Bible declares, so a man or woman thinketh, so is he or she. Right. So that means how can I not uh, how can I keep the word of God in my mouth? I, I, I say what I think. So if I'm meditating on the word, then the word should do what it should come forth from my lips. So that's why it says meditate on it day and night. When you're riding in your car, meditate on it. And, and the best thing that I've discovered to do and also helps with understanding the word is meditate on a scripture day. And, and that, that's my scripture for the day that I'm meditating on, that, I, that I'm focusing on, that I'm committing to my memory. And then, so the Bible declares, when you meditate and when you speak, the Bible declares, uh, uh, then you shall do. Somebody say winning strategy. Notice the word of God. I have to meditate. When I meditate, I will speak. And when I speak, I will what? I will do. I'm going to say it one more time. I meditate. In other words, I study the word. When I study the word and it's in my head, it will then be found in my what? Mouth. I'll speak it. And then the more I think it, the more I speak it, the more I what? Do it. I'm going to say it one more time just in case somebody got lost. The more I think it, the more I speak it, the more I what? I'll do it. I'll do it. And then it says that you may observe to do according to all that is written in it. Watch this. For then. For then. 
What does that mean? That then indicates you have to do what came before the then. And oftentimes in life, we think that we don't have to think it, we don't have to speak it, we don't have to do it. All we got to do is then pray for it. And God will what? Do it. That's not how this works. God is saying your winning strategy for your life is more about you than it is about him. I'm going to say it one more time. The winning strategy for your life is more about you than it is God. I was watching uh, uh, not too too long ago. Uh, I, I love the movies. Not too long ago, uh, we were sitting at home, and it, I think it came on Netflix or Disney Plus or something. Uh, I was trying to, to to preoccupy the baby so I could do some work, and uh, I turned on Aladdin. And the thing about Aladdin is, you know, many of us are familiar with Aladdin. You rub the the lamp. The genie comes out, and you do what? You tell them your three wishes, they've done their job. And I said to myself, that's how we treat God. We rub when we need something. Lord, do it, and we expect God to do it. But in this season of my life, as I'm maturing, I'm realizing that really what I want from God, what I want out of my life, has less to do with God and more about my end of the bargain. That God is not a genie in a bottle that we pull out when we need something and put him back when we don't. That oftentimes, yes, God heals. But if the doctor tells me that I don't need to eat sugar, maybe I don't need to what? If at the end of the month, I want to see a certain amount of money in my bank account, hello, somebody said it, better stop spending. And God is sitting there like, wait a minute, you want me to bless you with more, and you're devouring what you have. So when we talk about a winning strategy for our life, It is more about us committing ourselves to the plan that God has given us if we want to be successful. All right. Now, what does it say? It says, for then uh, do all that is in it. For then you will make your own way prosperous. And we know prosperous is more than just money. Remember what we talked about? You got to think, you got to speak, you got to do. And then God said, guess what? Then you will make, and I love it, it says, you will make your way prosperous. You will make your own way prosperous. And when it talks about prosperity, We're talking about not just material wealth, but we're talking about joy and strength and peace and patience and prosperity in my family and relationships and all of those good things, right? And it says, and then you will have what? Good success. That sounds like a winning strategy, doesn't it? What complicates this? That this is what we're going to talk about for a second. What really complicates this process? Number one, number one, what, com- what, 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 what complicates this process? Repeat after me. Lack of self-awareness. Lack of self-awareness. Let's go to uh, Genesis chapter one. Verse 26 through 28. Genesis 1, 26 through 28. We'll give you a second to get there. And it reads, y'all there? Then God said, 
Let us make man in our image, according to our likeness. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds, over the air, and over the cattle, over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him, male and female, he created them. Then God blessed them. And God said to them, be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth and subdue it, have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over every living thing that moves on the earth. All right? Keep that in mind. We're going to go, go back to that in a second. Let's go to Luke chapter 17, verse 21. Luke 17, verse 21. Nor will they say, see here or see there, for indeed the kingdom of God is already what? Within you. Can I submit to you that in Joshua chapter 1, verse 8, God gives us a winning strategy, but the reason why we oftentimes fail to implement the winning strategy is because we have a lack of self-awareness. I take Genesis chapter 1 verse 26 through 28 seriously because when God was talking about Adam and Eve, he was talking about us too. He said, let us make man. Yes, it was Adam and Eve, but everything also that comes from man. Let us make man and create man and woman in our own image. In other words, when you have a self-awareness, you understand and you are whether I was created in the image and likeness of God. I wish I had some help in the house. I was created in the image and likeness of God. And when you see me, I may not look like much. When you see me, you may see physical deformities. I might be moving slow. I may not be the cutest. I may not have the most money, but I was still made in the image and likeness of God. And when I was made in the image and likeness of God, God said, man, not God, but man should have dominion. And what happens is the reason why we fail to implement a winning strategy is because we lose our self-awareness and we begin to believe the report of the enemy. We believed, uh, we began to believe what the enemy says about us instead of uh, remembering who God created us to be. I take it seriously. You, 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 you can call people. I talk to myself all the time. Because when I'm talking to myself, I'm reminding myself, I'm making myself aware of who I am. I am the head and not the tail. I am above and not beneath. Going to the doctor, I don't care what this doctor says, I'm well. I'm whole, I'm healed, I'm going to go through the process, I'm going to be obedient, but I'm not going to allow the enemy to take my self-awareness. The kingdom of God is already in me. I'm above. I'm not beneath. I'm a winner. I'm not a loser. I'm a lender. I'm not a borrower. God created me to love. God created me to, to, to bring about the kingdom of God. Somebody ought to yell self-awareness. So that goes another way. Not only do we lose self-awareness when we forget who God created us to be, but we also lose self-awareness when we ignore the enemy's strategy. What, what do I mean? What do I mean by that? Paul, if I had time, I would take you there. Paul said, what did Paul say? I prayed to the Lord three times to remove this thorn, what, from my flesh. So Paul was very well aware that, guess what, I got something that's ailing me. Now, some suppose that it was a physical ailment. Some suppose that it was a spiritual ailment. It was some sort of addiction or some sort of sin that Paul was dealing with. I don't care whether it's physical or spiritual. Everyone of us in here and watching are dealing with something. 
some sort of ailment. Alcohol, drugs, shopping, eating, whatever the case may be, we're all dealing with some sort of ailment. But what I love about it is Paul did not what? Ignore it. This is hard. We can't fix what we won't address. And sometimes we get ourselves in trouble because we don't want to admit certain things about our situation and we keep putting ourselves in the same situation to keep doing the same thing over and over again because we don't want to admit that we need help. You cannot be an alcohol addict and, and go to a bar. Jesus, help me, Lord. I'm just going to slip in there and I'm just going to see everybody. And now, <laughs> oh, I'm coming for y'all. No, I'm not going to St. Paul on the first Sunday. They serve juice. I'm going to go to the Catholic church where they serve something else, right? We have a lack of self-awareness. But Paul said, I'm aware that I got an issue. But in being aware of the issue, guess what I learned? Guess what Paul said I learned? That God's grace is sufficient. So that when the enemy tries to remind me and try, and I talked about your condition on Sunday, when the enemy tries to tell me I'm nothing more than my ailment or I'm nothing more than my condition, I'm nothing more than my, thron my thorn, my self-awareness brings me back to remind me I'm more than that because I'm justified by God's grace. So if we are going to implement the winning strategy, we got to be self-aware. Self-aware, number one, who we are that we are God's child. And self-aware, number two, of our own internal issues, our own battles, so that we can build a strategy around our battles. You, if you go in my office, there is a smoothie in my office right now. I need help with eating. Now, <laughs> I struggle. I struggle. I struggle. I struggle with sodas. I'm being honest. Don't put a cherry Coke in my face. And I don't want the zero sugar one. I want the real thing. I wear it well. Right. I wear it well. Somebody say thank you for that. But, but the thing about it is I got my smoothie. I'm going to just sip on my smoothie because if I come in here and I get a tad bit thirsty, I'm going to get that cherry Coke. Why? Because I'm what? Self-aware. And the winning strategy is built on my what? Self-awareness. All right. Number two, if we're going to implement a winning strategy, uh-oh, uh-oh, we got to move to self-analysis. Somebody ought to go with me to Psalm 51. And our media team, Sister Keisha is just so on it. Thank you. Psalm 51. Have, listen to these words, have mercy upon me, O God, according to your loving kindness, according to the multitude of your tender mercies, blot out my transgressions, wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin, for I acknowledge my transgressions and my sin is always before me. Against you, you only have I sinned and done this evil in your sight. That you may be found just when you speak and blameless when you judge. Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity and in sin my mother conceived me. Behold, you desire the truth in the inward parts and in the hidden part. You will make me to know wisdom. Purge me with hyssop and I shall be clean. Wash me and I shall be whiter than snow. Make me hear joy and gladness that the bones you have broken may rejoice. Hide your face from my sins and blot out all my iniquities. Create in me. Somebody ought to say create. Create in me a clean heart, O oh God, and renew a right or steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me away from your presence and do not take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation. And uphold me by your generous spirit. Then I will teach transgressors your ways. 
and sinners shall be converted to you. Deliver me from the guilt of bloodshed, O God. The God of my salvation and my tongue shall sing aloud of your righteousness. O Lord, open my lips and my mouth shall show forth your praise. For you do not desire sacrifice, or else I would give it. You do not delight in burnt offering. Watch this, y'all. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and a contrite heart. These, O God, you will not despise. Do good in your good pleasure to Zion. Build the walls of Jerusalem. I'm going to stop right there. So what does that mean? In, In this text, David is really analyzing himself. He's admitting I'm a sinner. I have transgressed against your law. My heart has turned from you. So, God, I want you to forgive me. Blot out all my transgressions, creating me a clean heart. He's saying, I know, God, you don't delight in us coming into the sanctuary and and, and, and just worshiping you and clapping our hands. You delight in us having a good spirit. You delight in us having a God-like spirit. So self-analysis is the ability to honestly listen to your life and know when you are walking according to God's purpose for your life. It is an examination of your beliefs, your motives, and your actions. David had to listen to his life. In Psalm 51, every major biblical character who experienced a fall and a failure had to go through a period of self-analysis. We all must go through a period of self-analysis if we are going to have a winning strategy. So let me say it for the folk who may not understand it like that. Like that. Let me say it like this. If can't nobody tell you about you, you need to go through a period of self-analysis. We all at certain points in our life, can't nobody tell us nothing. And if you talk, tell us you wrong, my brother messing with me. If, if you tell me I'm wrong, I'm going to tell you you wrong. But I heard something that was, that was transformative. What happens before a fall? Pride. And so what the Bible is saying is that we have to go through our self-analysis. If we're going to put a winning strategy together, not only must we, uh, not only must we uh, be self-aware, we got to go through a self-analysis. We ought to wake up every day, Lord, show me me. Show me where I can be better. Show me how I can do better. But this is the thing. We got to want it. Because when God shows us, we may not like what he shows us. And we may not like what he tells us we have to do. After Re- God never gives you a revelation for you to be the same. After God gives a revelation, the purpose of the revelation is to give you direction. God's not going to reveal and then say, go back to how you were before. After knowledge comes responsibility. So if we're going to have a winning strategy for our life, we got to be serious. Sister Harris will tell you, uh, uh, I, we have a staff call every week. We just had one this morning. What we did wrong, what we need to do better, an analysis. So that next Sunday, the same problem that we had this Sunday, we won't have next Sunday. And let me give another example. We had an air, con- have an air conditioning issue. We had one unit over here. Y'all can't see it. We had one unit over here. Guess what? After some analysis, we determined. It's still hot. So guess what? We got one back there. Somebody ought to say thank God for analysis. If we stop long enough to analyze ourselves, we will, God will show us what we need to do. Now, for the people who are watching online, let me give you this last one. 
Um, so, Keisha, I need to cut. We still got, I, I got one more minute. Okay. All right. Go, go to Matthew chapter 17. In order for them to do what they need to do, I have to keep it under a certain time. Matthew chapter 17, verse 14 through 21. And you can read it on the screen for the sake of time. Let me, let me move forward. And when they had come to the multitude, a man came to him, kneeling down to him and saying, Lord, have mercy on my son, for he is an epileptic and suffers severely, for he often falls into the fire and often into the water. So I brought him to your disciples, but they could not cure him. Then Jesus answered and said, O oh, faithless and perverse generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I bear with you? Bring him here to me. And Jesus rebuked the demon, and it came out of him, and the child was cured from that very hour. Then the disciples came to Jesus privately and said, why could we not cast it out? Let me back up. They went to Jesus because they realized there's a problem. So they became what? Aware. Now, when they say, you put the scripture back on the screen, why could we not cast them out? What is that? That's an analysis. We're analyzing why couldn't we do it? All right, let's keep going. So Jesus said to them, because of your unbelief. For assuredly, I say to you, if you have faith as a mustard seed, you will say to this mountain, move from here to there, and it will move. And... Nothing will be impossible for you. However, this kind does not go out except by what? Prayer and fasting. So what does this scripture indicate to us? We have to move from self-awareness to self-analysis to, this is a long word, self-actualization. It's on the screen. Self-actualization, which is the process of establishing oneself as a whole person and the ability to develop abilities and understanding. It is basically, self-actualization is basically realizing your full potential. So the disciples couldn't cast the demon out. So they went to Jesus and said, we can't cast out. They were aware. They said, why? He said, you don't believe. That was the analysis. It would be awfully bad to have the awareness and the analysis, but no solution. And to be honest with you, that's where a lot of us are. We know the problem. We've analyzed the problem, but we won't fix the problem. Can I tell you how many times I have sat in conversations, counseling conversations, and they say, well, I'm like this because my daddy left. I'm like this because my mother walked away. And I'm sitting there like, you know you got a problem. And you know why you got a problem. And you just put a period right there? Where's the self-actualization? Jesus gave them the self-actualization. This kind does not come out. Except by what? Prayer and fasting. So he was basically telling them, you got to pray and you got to fast. That is how you become the person that you have to be. And so as I end, if we are going to have a winning strategy, it's not enough for us to know the problem and diagnose the problem and analyze the problem. We then have to put the tools in place to move from the analysis to the actualization. And God is saying, guess what? I'll give it to you. How can I give it to you? Go to Joshua chapter 1 verse 8. This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you uh, 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 shall meditate on it day and night and then do it. And then you will have what? Good success. So we got to finish where we started. That if we're going to have a winning strategy, we got to trust that God is going to give us the tools that we need to move from the problem to the promise. 
Because guess what? The enemy is having a conference call about you right now. The enemy is having a meeting on you right now. And unless you have your strategy, you're going to be on the menu. But when you have your strategy, God will make you a winner. Let us pray. Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the power of your word. We ask now that you will bless it. Let it marinate and let us meditate on it. That we may move from analysis to anointing. Move from problem to promise. Lord, help us to win. Why? Because you won. You won the battle over sin and death. So you've given us the tools that we need to be victorious in our own life. Help us to implement your divine strategies for our life. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. God bless our online audience. We'll see you next week, same time.